Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio Program. I'm Daniel Davis. Testing. This is one of those things that we try to discover where we're at and where we want to go. For most of us who are trying to discover our family tree line and going into genealogy, we discover sometimes this is a particular way that seems daunting, even at times almost impossible. On the Beyond 50 radio program today, we're joined with CEO and founder of what is known as Family Tree DNA, which is an at-home test that you can take, and you can go back five generations to discover who your family is and the roots. I'd like to welcome the Beyond 50 radio program today, our guest, Mr. Bennett Greenspan. Bennett, thank you for joining us here on the program today. Um, it's nice to be on your program, Daniel. Now, what got you started in DNA testing for people in their lineage? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, first, I should say that I've been a genealogist since I was a boy. That takes me back to when Lyndon Johnson was president of the United States. I drew my first family tree, and I was bitten by the bug at the tender age of 12. Uh, I've picked up and put down and picked up and put down my genealogy many times, from the 60s to the 90s, and in the 90s, I did a DNA, um, I had a, I'm sorry, I did a, 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 a genealogical research into one of my lines, and lo and behold, I found people who had the same last name, but they lived in Buenos Aires, and I was wondering if I was related to them. I couldn't prove or disprove that using the conventional paper trail genealogy, and I started thinking about my problem and realized that I could use molecular biology, in other words, the male inherited Y chromosome, to prove that my cousin in California was related to those folks in Argentina. And that was really the beginning of the, uh, of the genetic genealogy industry, and it all came from um, me uh, having a problem and thinking about how I might be able to solve my problem and not giving up. Now, I think it's pretty exciting because we're in a day of technology where it seems so to each of us that there's almost nothing we can't do or find out. And this is certainly one of those that made genealogy seemingly a little bit easier, hasn't it? It certainly has because it's allowed people... Um, to get beyond a missing paper trail. You know, a lot of times the paper trail is lost due to a fire or a flood or a war, uh, and, and consequently we don't have the sacrosanct piece of paper to prove a relationship. But DNA, in effect, replaces the need in many cases for that piece of paper. In effect, it's, it's a surrogate uh, for what genealogists have typically looked for in the courthouses and in the census records. Now, how did you come to develop this particular test? It seems pretty detailed. I know that I had the opportunity to take it, and I'm still interested when the results come. But, you know, this comes from both your mother and your father's side, so this is pretty interesting how this works. Well, let, let me first uh, go back, if, if I might, and explain that there are three tests that are typically used by genetic genealogists. The first test is the Y chromosome that I mentioned earlier. That allows a man to look at his father's 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 direct male line. Correspondingly, there's another test called the mitochondria, which is DNA that we receive only from our mothers, and we can trace that because all women pass that down to the next generation. The third test, the one that you're mentioning uh, or alluding to, we call the family finder. That's based on technology that wasn't even available in 2000 uh, when I started offering DNA testing commercially. Uh, that's a product. Uh, that became available in about 2010, and it looks at hundreds of thousands of unique data points uh, in your genome that you receive from your mother and your father, and we've built some technology which allows you to match against family members in the aunt, uncle, niece, nephew, first cousin, second cousin, and third cousin levels. And that test also gives you what we refer to as 
ethnic percentages. So that'll tell you whether uh, you know it or not. If you think you're 100% English, you might come out and show that you're 10 or 15% Scandinavian um, as well, and that would be due to the Viking influence on, uh, on England or on the northern coast of Europe. So that's a kind of a nice addition. It's not a genealogical addition. It's a history or an anthropological addition to this very interesting family finder genealogy test that we've created. I know that living here in the United States, you know, Americans tend to be a mix of a lot of different things. I bet this really brings people, I guess, to an interesting place of peace, knowing what their ethnicity actually is as well, kind of finding out who you really are. Uh, you're you're absolutely right. Although I will I will add uh, that if you don't really want to know the answer to the question, maybe you shouldn't ask the question because a lot of our customers get their results back and they're surprised, uh, and then it eventually dawns on them that uh, there was a great grandparent that no one talked about, and um, you know he may have been a little lighter or darker in complexion than the rest of the family and so they don't know where that comes from and quite often by doing a uh, one of these DNA tests they might figure out that that one ancestor was let's say from southern Italy or the Mediterranean rather than from northern Europe that kind of explains some of the phenotypic differences that you might find within the mosaic of a family. Now, it's pretty interesting. Now, people probably have different reasons for wanting to do this test, don't they? It isn't just based on wanting to know about your family. Are there other things they're looking for as well? Well, for, first of all, uh, we cater heavily to the adoptee market okay. because there are probably a couple of million adoptees or the children of adoptees living in America, and they don't know anything about their uh, their parents, their biological parents, or that set of biological uh, grandparents. And so they wonder, uh, number one, can they reach out and find relatives? Uh, number two, they're interested in their, uh, in their ethnic background because, of course, adoptees are like a blank slate. They really don't know any of this information. So that's a particular group that has become very, very interested in this DNA testing. We also do a lot of DNA testing for what's referred to as surname projects. So if your surname is uncommon, it may be very easy to go onto the Internet and find the five or ten other people in the United States that share your same surname. But if your surname is Walker or Smith or Williams or one of the name, place, occupation uh, surnames, it's a very, very challenging task. And really the only way you can break through that very, very high proverbial brick wall is to do a DNA test because that will eliminate all the people with your surname that you're not related to and just focus you on the, the small number of people that you are related to, and then hopefully you can reach out to them and graft your family tree onto what we hope is a much more extensive family tree that your match will be able to provide you with. Now, have you had, had people who have taken this test and you've given them the results and kind of went over them where they finally found that they have discovered themselves? I don't know if that question makes sense, but sometimes people can feel a sense of being lost or unidentified when they really don't know, as you were talking about adoptees, for instance, you know, and being able to discover, geez, I finally have a connection here now. How do I go about finding these people? I bet is, is that kind of a difficult task? Well, certainly it, it's a difficult task, but as the databases get larger and larger, uh, there's greater and greater opportunities for someone to take a DNA test and to randomly find someone in the database who's, uh, who, you know, who's a match to them. Now, it's all the more exciting when you have someone who has a mystery or a rumor or, uh, so to speak, an old wives' tale in the family. Um, you mentioned earlier in the show that, that 
uh, we in America are, are quite mixed, and that's absolutely right. You have a lot of people from Ireland who came here who might have married someone from Southern Europe or from Eastern Europe. Uh, and, and so uh, it's, it's generally quite interesting when someone does a DNA test, if they have that hole in their genealogy, uh, you know, sometimes DNA is able to answer that question. For example, if someone believes that they're descended from a, uh, a woman many generations back who was Native American, they might be able to do a DNA test and find, let's say, that some portion of their DNA is actually Native American, and that's going to be the evidence that they were lacking that allows them to, you know, to kind of settle what could be a decades or generation uh, or multi-generational rumor that's in the family. And so a lot of people do find closure to the questions that they're asking by doing a DNA test. And for some people, they don't find closure. They just find that they you know, have more research to do. You know, and that's one of the things that made this really intriguing for me because for a long time, um, and my mother seems to sometimes be uncertain, but in talking with an uncle of mine, uh, my lineage alleged goes back on my father's side in the Native American, the Cherokee. And so I was really intrigued by this because I've been wanting to find out how true is this, you know, uh, Apparently, my grandfather was full-blooded, and then my dad was a half-breed, so, you know, you kind of do the numbers there. But I was kind of curious, when people try to pursue this, let's say, for that, you know, to discover their Native American heritage, so maybe they can find a way to, you know, when it turns up that way for them, find a tribe to be recognized as that. Do you find people are actually doing that as well? Well, I'm finding people that want to do that, but in in practicality, it doesn't happen very often. Uh, and, and there are a lot of reasons for that that have nothing to do with us but have more to do with the Native American tribes. Uh, Native American tribes have heretofore not been very willing to actually do DNA tests, which means that if I try to match you up against other individuals who might you know, know that they have Native American ancestry, if they haven't tested, it's very, very difficult to do that on either the Y-DNA test or the, or the mitochondria test. However, on the family finder test, in the example that you gave, where, uh, where doing the numbers, you would be about 25% Native American, if, if I, if I uh, heard you correctly, and that's something that absolutely would show on the family finder ethnicity test, at which point you would be able to answer the question, the original question, which is, is this story true? Do we have Native American ancestry? Now, from a tribal standpoint, it's very important to remember that a thousand years ago, there probably weren't any tribes in America. There were probably clans and when clans get larger, family clans get larger, they tend to band together and they become what's called bands. Uh, and those are small groups of people who live together for uh, mutual security and, and maybe for division of labor. Uh, tribes itself is a newer concept and because the tribes lived in close proximity and sometimes were fighting and sometimes were loving, the genetic signature of a particular tribe uh, today is almost impossible to determine. What is possible to determine is if someone actually has Native American ancestry written into the history book contained in our cells. Now, that's kind of interesting because, you know, for instance, I've come across people over time, over the years, who have uh, claimed to be Native American, and certainly they're looking to, you know, I guess, the best way to put that is looking for benefits, for instance. <laughs> so, right. you know, they, they, they go about the process of trying to discover, you know, how much of my heritage is that because there's a certain percentage you're supposed to be for this to be able to happen. And, and so do you find people trying to do that um, or using this information for that purpose? Well, certainly 
uh, in in our 16 years as as running a commercial company doing this, we have had lots of people who have come to us um, uh, with what I'll just refer to as uh, you know questionable motives, because as you're certainly aware, the the laws that were put in place to benefit Native Americans was because you know the Native Americans had been disadvantaged for such a long time. And I don't believe that those benefits, as, as you say, were, you know, were put into place for uh, basically Caucasian people who had successfully escaped being Native American and had blended into the mosaic of, of, of America. And so I don't really think that the benefits that you mentioned you know, were ever intended uh, for those folks. And, and it's made very hard for those folks to actually accomplish that because it's very difficult for uh, a Caucasian who has not lived uh, uh, among Native Americans for several generations you know, to be able to actually connect to them uh, as individuals, but even more so, it's very, very difficult, uh, even more difficult for that individual to be able to connect with a particular tribe, and the benefits that you mentioned flow from tribal association or tribal membership. Well, that certainly makes a lot of sense. You know, as you were saying, there are people that come in with motives other than, but this is really something where people just want to find out who they are. Correct. And if someone wants to find out who they are, it's very, very easy today and really not very expensive. For example, at Family Tree DNA, the test that looks at the aunt, uncle, niece, nephew out to the third cousin level and gives you percentage testing, that, that test is $100. The, the Y-DNA test that looks back um, uh, and that will tell, let's say, a man named Walker when he compares to the other 900 men named Walker in our database and he only finds you know, four matches uh, which w- which would be wonderful because he just eliminated 996 people named Walker who have the same last name but don't have lineage with him. And really, that's the intent of most of our customers. And the reason for that is that we in America are a nation of immigrants. Uh, most of our ancestors left the old country because it wasn't necessarily the good old country, in other words, they had reasons to come to a better place and choose a, you know, a new life in a new country. And so uh, we have tended over the decades and generations to become rather disconnected from what for most of us is our European roots. And now that we are a graying society, uh, retiring in good health with lots of years uh, left in front of us, a lot of our customers, men and women who, who are retired, have decided that instead of picking up gardening, they're going to pick up uh, genealogy, and it becomes a, a real new pursuit by someone who's young enough and healthy enough uh, and, and, and uh, mentally sharp enough to be able to do the research and to find, uh, so to speak, buried information that is generally available if we only take the time uh, and and look. (laughs) I I don't know why, but I had this thought when you were talking about how we're kind of mixed here in America of the movie Stripes starring Bill Murray, where he says, we're mutts. Our forefathers have been kicked out of every country there is. (laughs) Well, he's actually, there's more truth in that than, you know, than, 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 uh, might be apparent when when you hear the statement, but bo- first of all, we are genetic mutts. Uh, a thousand or <laughs> kind two of a thousand. funny thing to think about, but there's truth to it. And <laughs> there is truth to it. Uh, I mean, think about it this way: uh, eight or nine thousand years ago, England was covered by a sheet of ice a mile thick, and nobody lived there. And at that time, our ancestors were hunters and gatherers. So when the elk or the deer moved south because it was getting cold, our ancestors did the same thing. And then when the ice began to recede and the animals started moving north again, finding new pasture land, uh, our ancestors followed them because that was dinner. Uh, 
And so we have moved around Europe, and the peoples that are in Europe today in a physical place may not have been in that same physical place with a modern construct called a country. They might not have been there four or 5,000 years ago. And so our history is much more complex than we realize, and of course we don't have any paper records to confirm that, although today we do have genetic information which does confirm that, and so it's led to an entire new genre of genetic genealogists reading anthropological um, you know, papers that come out of leading universities all around the world, and in many ways pushing those scientists to publish faster research um, you know, uh, more vigorously to provide all of us better roadmaps to our not-so-recent history. Now, we've talked quite a bit about why do the test and the motivations behind it. Now, let's talk about the test itself. What exactly happens when somebody says, you know, I've heard this and I'm interested in pursuing it. What are the steps and how does this test work? Okay, that, that's a good question. Uh, the first thing that someone uh, does, uh, because these are direct-to-consumer tests, uh, the first thing that someone would do is come to the Family Tree DNA website, select the type of test that they want to order, and then place an order online. And about a week later, uh, that person will receive their uh, test kit in the mail. Uh, we use what's called a buckle scraper, which uh, the easiest way to describe it is like a fancy Q-tip that someone would scrape the inside of their cheek and then they send us back the, the tips of our scraper in a nice little uh, uh, test tube vial that we have put a preservative in. And then once the kit comes back to our facility, it's going to be checked in. And as soon as it's checked in, an email is sent to the person giving them a password. So now they've got their user ID and their password uh, so that they can log into the kit. We will then... Uh, extract the DNA, which means we will pop open the cells and harvest the DNA from the center or the nucleus of the cell. And uh, at that point, we will we'll put the DNA uh, into our robotic freezer, and then every couple of days we will draw out generally 96 or 384 samples and we will begin to process it. Processing may take a couple weeks by the time it gets processed and uh, comes out of the instrument and then is read by a technician, and then we will post the results. And as soon as we post the results to the individual's account, an email will be sent to the individual saying, you've got new results at Family Tree DNA. They'll come to our website and log in, at which point they can see the names and the email addresses of the people that they match. They can see genetically how close they are, whether they're an exact match or, or a near exact match. And the more closely two people match on the Y and the MT DNA test, the more recently they were related. The same thing holds true for the autosomal-based family finder test. And so then the individual can start reaching out and contacting people, trying to figure out how they're related. If they don't know how they're related, simply by, you know, by looking at the, uh, you know, at the names of their matches. Sometimes your cousins come up. A couple of days ago, we had an individual who had been given up for adoption 85 years ago, and uh, his, his biological uh, full sibling's daughter had done a DNA test, and she was amazed when she had a match to someone who was, um, you know, who, who had only been rumored in the family uh, to have been, you know, given up for adoption uh, eight, eight decades earlier. And so that was a wonderful family reunion, and some of those things happen, and then some other people don't get so lucky, and they just need to wait as, you know, for the database to get larger. So this database is a collection of people that have done this particular test then, right? That, that is correct. Okay, very good. 
Now you must have some really interesting stories about how what the you know the circumstances the outcomes are from people, haven't you? I have great stories. <laughs> I can uh, some of them, some of them I can talk about. Some of them I'm a little reticent to talk about. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but uh, but we have had people who have you know found uh, lost families when people were given up for adoption. We have people who thought they knew their genealogy uh, well enough to know their ethnicity and found that that wasn't the case, at which point they've had to go back into the family uh, genealogy and do some research. And sometimes they find out that there you know, was an out-of-wedlock event in the family that, that no one ever knew about or talked about. Uh, and so, uh, so every story is different because every person is different but everyone will get a story uh you know based on their dna when they do a dna test yeah it's really interesting as you were talking about people reaching out to others who they've discovered are you know relations and uh so some years ago i finally kind of got that bug uh to reach out to uh three half brothers that i had never met and I don't really think they knew who I was. And so uh, through a friend of my my uh, biological father, I said, you know, well, how do I get some information to be able to find or contact these people? And so I was able to do that. And so what I ended up doing was uh, contacting their stepfather. And, you know, as the conversation would be, he was, well, I really didn't know that you existed, <laughs> you know, kind of a thing. <laughs> so this isn't something where I would think, you'll rush out there and say, hey, by the way, do you know we're related? I mean, this can have an impact on people. So, you know, I, I'm sure there must be etiquettes and protocols to go about this. But what had happened is I described, I said, you know, well, here's the deal. And the only thing I'm really trying to do is just reach out to let them know that I'm out here. If they're interested, here's my contact information. He says, well, you know, it's been 30 or whatever some odd years. Uh, you know, you don't mind wait, waiting a little longer. I said, you know, as long as it takes. I've taken the initiative, and, and that's the best we can do there. And I think it was probably about two months later, which really surprised me, I get a call from the youngest of the three who, in, incidentally enough, happens to be named Danny of all people. <laughs> <laughs> so now I've got a younger half-brother named Danny. <laughs> Interestingly enough, I've got a stepbrother named Dennis, and my half-brother, well, we'll just call him my real brother, Dennis. So now there's two Dennises and two Dannys in my family of all crazy things. But, <laughs> you know, when it comes to doing that, though, to reaching out to these people, you know, do you suggest particular ways people should go about doing this? Because this can probably, I would think, on the receiving end, be a little shocking, wouldn't it? Yes, it is a little shocking. Um, And I would use the word sensitive. In other words, when you're reaching out in a case like this, you need to be sensitive. Um, Hopefully they'll be sensitive to you, but you're the one that's calling. Uh, And it can be quite a shock for people. Uh, Sometimes... Uh, it's a shock, and people aren't happy, uh, you know, that you called. Sometimes uh, people are saying, "I wish you would have called, uh, you know, much earlier," because we had a we we knew that we had half siblings in the family. We just didn't know where they were, what their name was, and now through the miracle of DNA, you know, they've been able to connect. So I would say that the emotions or the feelings really run the gamut from, you know, from sadness to euphoria. Uh, I think that the story that you told is, is very, very typical, that it sometimes takes a while for, uh, you know, for the family who receives the phone call to digest the information, the new facts. Uh, but most people come around, and genealogists um, probably more so, because genealogists are really on the search for the truth. Um, uh, and it also makes it easier that if there's a birth out of wedlock um, you know, it found in a genealogy, it's generally two generations or four generations back, and so you didn't know the people so that the personal sting of some interpersonal event um, you know, is, is generations in the past and is just a fact or a footnote you know, for most genealogists. But I would always recommend that people 
treat other people, you know, very sensitively, um, and that when you and, and choreograph your phone call, what you're going to make your phone call, so that you've had a chance to think about what you want to say and a chance to think about how those words may be being received on the other end, and and so in other words, just common sense. Well, I totally agree because I was also someone who was on that receiving end. Interestingly enough, the youngest half brother I was telling you that I contacted, okay, so I talked to him twice, and then that was pretty much the end of it, and that was fine. And it was really interesting to listen to him talk because I could kind of hear me through his voice. You know, mm-hmm. there are things you just know. And well, anyway, so all of a sudden, I think it was around 2008. My wife comes downstairs and she says, there's a guy named Danny on the phone for you. And I was like, are you kidding me? (laughs) And I mean, this was some years later, probably at least 10 years later. And so I get on the phone and I was like, hey, you know, what's going on? And he says, you know, I thought I would call you. And he had this big apology for how he felt he had treated me. And I said, no, it's no big deal, really. You know, I was just reaching out to let you know I was out here, you know, how we wanted to pursue this relationship was really on your terms, you know, kind of a thing. Well, he says, well, the reason I'm calling you is, you know, uh, I just got contacted by a gal who's our sister. (laughs) Now, imagine, now I've got a half-sister out there who's actually the oldest of my dad's fooling around lineage. (laughs) We'll we'll just call it that. And so, you know, I called her right away, you know, and I was excited to hear that, but I've actually lost her contact information. I haven't been in touch with her since, and I'm thinking, I wonder what she must be thinking, but... The bottom line is, when I was contacted, it was really interesting. I was like, okay, we've talked, this is neat, but what else do we talk about? (laughs) I thought this would be a very important aspect of this conversation for people to be aware of, that once you discover your DNA and and you link up with people that are, for instance, in your database, this is something that you you really need to pay attention to. You don't just kick open the door, hey, we're related kind of a thing, so... No, I think I think that you're giving out real, um, you know, real good advice. Uh, you, shouldn't go, you, sh- <laughs> you shouldn't go into this with, uh, I think, with with large expectations. Um, and that way, uh, if you get a lot out of it, if you find that the uh, that the half sibling, you know, is really interested and really excited about this, that's wonderful. But I, I would say that may be the exception rather than the rule. And I think that. I think that shock or surprise, um, you know, is, are, are probably the first emotions when, you know, when someone finds out that they have a half-sibling that they were never told about. Um, but uh, ultimately, there's a lot of thoughts that are going to flow. Why didn't my parents tell me what was hidden, et cetera, et cetera. And so it takes time for people to digest that information. But I think that in general, most people come around, and most people are actually pretty excited to, uh, you know, to find biological family that that they didn't know they had or knew they had, and had and had just so to speak lost. Now I'm curious, Bennett, uh, as we're coming to the close of the program here, how accurate is this test? Uh, that's a very good question. First, as far as accuracy goes, uh, everything that's done in all laboratories today is is barcoded, controlled. So the likelihood of a sample mix-up, while not impossible, is you know is very, very, very small. That's number one. Number two, um, the science has been around uh, certainly on the Y and the MT DNA tests for you know, for a decade and a half or two decades. And so, you know, so it's, it's very well understood uh, and, and has been explained uh, multiple times. The accuracy is very high that if you match someone on the Y or the MT DNA test that, that you have a relative, the question is how far back in time did you actually share a common set of of parents or grandparents with that individual. When you use the autosomal test, that's good for about three generations, or or third, actually third cousins. Um, When you look at that particular test, um, it's a different uh, situation. Uh, You'll be able to have very, very high confidence in your closest matches, but you'll also get lots and lots of matches 
that we don't know and you won't easily know how you're related to them. And so uh, I'm going to also say that those are accurate matches because you do share blocks of DNA in common with those people, but whereas on the Y DNA test, if you match a man, you know that you and he share a common male ancestor going back X number of generations. When you're trying to match up using the uh, recombinant or autosomal DNA test that we call Family Finder, they might be related on your mom's side or your dad's side, and they really could be descended from any of your eight great-grandparents or 16 great-great-grandparents, which means that you may end up with matches to people, and you may spend a fair amount of time figuring out how you're related to them. Oh, this is also fascinating here, and it's just exciting. As I was saying, there are areas where technology has improved. I think this is one of those areas that I think is outstanding because I remember when I thought I wanted to begin finding my lineage, you know, but this was probably almost 20 years ago. Back then it was a paper trail, and I'm like, forget this. <laughs> you yep. know, that's just that's a daunting task. But, you know, nowadays it's a matter of just going to your website and, and taking the test and, and then just kind of going from there. Mm-hmm which I'd like you to give out for our listeners out there so they can discover how they can come to, to find out more about this and uh, maybe take the test themselves. Sure. Our, our website is called Family Tree DNA. We're located in Houston, uh, Texas, and uh, hopefully no one will confuse us with uh, any of the other guys who have, uh, who have copied this wonderful idea that we had 16 years ago. And most everything is done, uh, is done online. Although if people have questions, they should always uh, feel free to find the contact form uh, on the main page of the Family Tree DNA website and send us off a question because we feel that, you know, that the best customers are the customers who understand not only the technology but what they're trying to accomplish before they spend their money. Very good, and I think that's a very important uh, thing for you to be telling the listeners is, you know, don't come in here with these motives as some of the ones we were discussing earlier. Oh, I've discovered, you know, that in my relatives, this guy here is filthy, stinking rich, so I think it's time <laughs> to knock on the door. It ain't going to work. <laughs> it ain't going to work. <laughs> well, Bennett, thanks a lot for taking the time to join us on the program and describe this family tree DNA test. I think this is something our listeners are going to find of great benefit, especially if they're doing some sleuthing themselves just really to know, and I think that's the most important reason you should be doing this in the first place. Well, Daniel, thank you very much. Thank you again. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. Discover more by visiting us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50, and we encourage you to sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter. Stay up to date and in the know with what's going on on Beyond 50 Radio. You can also follow us on Twitter at Beyond 50 Radio as well as Facebook. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway.